ADHD Rewired, episode 482. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDRewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We are here for our live monthly Q&A. It is April 11th, 2023, and I am joined here by the uh, the panel of, of panelists. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to uh, let everyone say hello. We got MJ of ADHD Diversified, our lead Hi. admin, our uh, podcast host of I just said that ADHD diversity. <laughs> you sure did. There we go. It's happening. It's all good. Happy April. Happy Wah-wah. April. All right. Uh, and we got Coach Kristen Martz. Oh, you meant for me to talk. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Hi. Yep. That's how this works. <laughs> <laughs> I love the laugh. I work on blurting a lot. <laughs> so I was waiting for the instruction. Hey. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and we have we are super excited to introduce brand new to the ADHD coaching team, ADHD Rewired coaching team, Mr. Brian Entler. Hello, Brian. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, y'all out there listening. Welcome, welcome. Glad that you made it here. And of course, we also have Lisa Cisla, my executive assistant, who is also helping on all the things on the back end. Hi, everyone. All right. And we have a very important person here, and that person's name is Chris, who's going to be kicking it off with our first question. Chris, go for it. Uh, Good morning. Um, Nothing like putting on the hot seat right out of the gate. (laughs) I've had ADHD for a really long time. Uh, Recently, I've also been diagnosed with treatment-resistant depression, so I've never been able to take any ADHD medicines. I tried 12 years ago, seven years ago, and they just make me feel speedy and less certain of myself. Also, two other times in my adult life, I have tried various forms of antidepressants, and I tried four different ones from January through March of this year, and I've uh, been diagnosed with treatment-resistant depression, so I cannot take any antidepressants whatsoever. So my question is, it's hard to get help when you have these things, so I just thought I'd ask the experts Besides exercise, which I'm getting much better at, what other tips would you have to help the ADHD and also the mood and depression because they are kind of aligned somewhat? How, how severe would you say the depression is? I would say um, a nine out of 10. Hmm. Now, right now, I, I've got it down to, to like a six. That's great. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Kristen uh, start with this. I have some thoughts that I want to... I want to see where she's going to go with this. Okay. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Um, a couple of things. Being an LCSW, I'm a therapist. And so, you know, my brain goes to types of intervention treatment if you wanted to go that path. I think CBT is um, very good uh, for reframing your thinking because your thinking impacts how you're feeling. Uh, I mean, you cannot change your triggering situations just by, you know, removing yourself. I mean, you could do that, but that's not living life. Mm -hmm. Um, And what you can do is uh, become more cognizant of what is that first thought, at least the first thought that you can, uh, you know, develop an awareness around um, with different triggering situations, and then begin to restructure what you're thinking at that time. It's called reframing. 
which will impact the feeling that comes from that. There is also, you said PTSD. Um, I actually went and got trained to deliver EMDR treatment, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing, because it was so helpful to me as a patient first. And I'm not saying everybody has the same experience. I hear lots of positive work, but I tell you what, I walk out of there lighter every time I do. There's a lot to it. So you have a lot of the talk therapy that goes around it also. But the moment that you do the actual saccades and um, intervention with all the tools, I walk out of there lighter every time. It's, it's a really amazing treatment I have found. Now, if you didn't want to go into treatment, I'm thinking mindfulness meditation could be very impactful and helpful. And I have a feeling Brian might be going there. So I'm going to let him speak to that because awesome. he's, he's done a lot more of that than I have. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Uh, yeah, I love to talk about mindfulness. And uh, it's the first thing I thought of when I heard you know, medication resistant or treatment resistant. Mindfulness in today's popular culture seems like so over promoted, especially by like healthcare maintenance organizations that it almost loses its credibility. But it is a really powerful tool. Eric and I were just discussing this the other day that PTSD and the effects of ADHD and depression live in the body somatically. And there's really any solution that doesn't include that, any treatment program that doesn't include that is probably going to be somewhat diminished in its in its efficacy. So I was going to ask, Chris, do you have a relationship with mindfulness or any kind of practice or experience? I am getting better at mindfulness. I do have, um, I have been in a therapy, a CBD with a good psychologist since the beginning of COVID. And I'm not ashamed one bit to say that it is, I'm three years and running. And I am still going and I'm getting better and better. I have a my primary doctor, my psychologist, and a psychiatrist that I really got on board. I was at a point four months ago where I wasn't sure that I wanted to be around anymore. Mm. So I got a psychiatrist and got everybody on board and I got all of those three connected. And I am trying a new treatment that I will share more about at a later date that seems to be doing very well but I still have a lot of ups and downs. So to answer your question, I, my mindfulness practices are definitely improving. It's just so, it's so interesting to me that ADHD makes it so freaking hard to do what we need to help ourselves the most. Gosh, it's terrible. True story. True story. Yeah. You know, Chris, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning here, and it's interesting because I, for for kind of years, I've been like debating whether or not I even wanted to sort of uh, put light on this topic uh, on the podcast. But the there is continues to be a growing amount of of good research that is supporting psychedelic assisted therapies um, for the tr tr specifically for treatment of, of treatment resistant depression and trauma. Um, there's some of the studies I did this um, 30 some hour uh, uh, trauma training for clinicians last year. And one of the, the things it looked at was comparing uh, a single dose of a, of a psychedelic assisted therapy to EMDR. And it was showing that, that for some of these people that a single dose of psychedelic assisted therapy had not only a faster remission rate, but it was done and delivered in one single dose. I don't know if we can say yet, this is absolutely like gold standard practice evidence base. It is getting really, really close to that um, if it's not already there. So I know there's there's that, there's uh, uh, ketamine, which I know is being used for treatment resistant re de uh, depression. So I think these are things that I think for, for many, many years, a lot of clinicians kind of sort of stayed away from because we weren't really sure what the, the evidence has really shown. And as, you know, I think in different parts of the country, in the U.S. anyways, as uh, the laws are changing, more research is now being able to be done on these things. And it is something that we should be keeping our eye on because I think it's showing a lot of promise. Well, to that point, Eric, I was going to wait to mention this. Uh, I was actually going to email you before the next meeting, but I, uh, I'll go ahead and go there because you, um, you opened up the box. My psychiatrist did uh, recommend Sprovalto treatments to me. Tomorrow will be my third one. And I already feel like I'm just a little bit lighter in my step and lighter in my moods. I still have a lot of the same symptoms, 
the end goal is not to make you happy, but it's to help you not feel as depressed. Yeah. And although it's early, I will report back next month. Um, I am very, very excited about this journey that I'm on. When I, I had to try three different antidepressants and able for my insurance company to approve it. Mm. So I went through January, February, and March in living hell because I had to prove to them that I had TRD. And at the very last meeting, my psychiatrist took me to the room that they administered it in, and he showed it to me because he knew I needed hope. Mm. And it did provide me hope. And I subsequently have been approved for it. And I look forward to sharing my experience with it because I am also a firm believer with what I've experienced so far and what my psychiatrist has told me is that it does help with depression, but like many things, it permeates to your other other problems as well. So I am beginning that, Eric, and uh, I'll report back. And I truly feel that that's part of the reason why I'm doing just a little bit better. That's awesome to hear. Chris, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, back from you next month. Thanks, guys. You bet. Oh, Chris, you got something else? I wanted to tag something to the end of that. Chris, I am so grateful that you did decide to open up and be really vulnerable just now. It brings up a really important point, a tip that I like to give people is um, because it sounds like you already somewhat knew about the resistance and yet you had to go through formality, um, you know, formal interventions to prove it. It is very helpful when you first seek out treatment to document and have your doctor document as much as possible that could keep you from having a delay in future treatments when those aren't working. It's a, tr it's a double-edged sword, a double-edged blade almost with the idea of, yeah, but I don't want everything recorded. Well, if you don't, then sometimes you go through this three months of hell because you have to do it for insurance purposes. Um, so just work with your team on how they document. Um, and I just want that to be a really big tip out there for everyone. Uh, the documentation piece is there's, there's a real big um, uh, benefit to it, even though we tend to talk mostly about the negative impact of it. So thank you so much, Chris, and good luck to you. Um, I'm so happy that you're getting some hope from this. Uh, thanks. Well, thank you. It's been a hard road and it's just crazy because as much as I need help, it was so hard to keep going and pushing to get it. Insurance initially declined it and we had to resubmit some different stuff. And I just knew that I was getting so low that I just kept plowing through. So as a tip to my fellow friends out there, you just keep plowing through and you'll eventually get there. But I just wanted to give up so often and I'm glad to be here and thank you all. We're, we're glad you're here too. Brian? I just wanted to congratulate Chris on all the wins that I heard in that. We obviously saw the, the negatives and the things that are lacking, but I hearing so much grit and determination and seeking out the treatment that you need and congratulations. I just needed to be needed to be noted. Thank you so much, Brian. You're just killing me. Thank you though. That's awesome. We love you, Chris. Keep, keep Thanks, on guys. doing what you're doing. All right, let's go to our next question. That was awesome. Deborah has a question about chat GPT. All right. So, um, I love chat GPT. Um, I mean, I could probably go on and on about how much I love chat GPT, but let me talk about some of the many ways that, that I'm using it. So first of all, it learns from you. So it actually, like if you struggle with any kind of writing or idea generation, like that can help you with that. I've had it um, write emails, reply to emails. I've, I've had it help me reply to uh, messages in different form places on my and social media. Um, I even had it once re uh, re help me draft a reply to a text message uh, to a family member. Um, that was kind of an awkward uh, kind of message I needed to send. Today, we had um, in, in our alumni sessions, we did a thing on planning some, some spring cleaning stuff. So yesterday, I went over to chat GPT and I said, uh, give me a list of ideas uh, that we can do for, for spring cleaning. And it gave me 20 great ideas. Someone in my community uh, today shared that they had done something similar to that, but asked it to make a schedule for cleaning. And it was able to uh, assign the, the people that, that uh, she had mentioned um, were available, how long each task would take so it can do like time prediction. Um, I mean, it's the stuff that it can do is kind of mind blowing. 
uh, something come up with ideas. And I kind of look at it as a writing partner. Most, I would say 90% of the stuff that I uh, um, have used with it for writing purposes when I'm putting something out there, it helps because, you know, looking at a blank template or blank canvas can be overwhelming, right? So it's sort of that starting point. You get the, it, it generates what, how it's responding. And then it's, you just kind of keep tweaking it back and forth. And you can, you can say, all right, make this sound a little bit more, um, I don't know, insert any emotion word, right? And you can uh, you tell it who you are, say, Hey, I want you to act as a um, you know, act as an ADHD coach, right? And I'm struggling with getting started. What can I like? Give me five things that I can maybe do to help me get started, right? So there's it's learning about the prompting language, which is super helpful. And there's tons of people who are pu putting out free content. I follow a bunch of people uh, on social media who are doing like Chat GPT videos for for prompts. Um, it's to me, it's it's incredible, and I think it's worth everyone's time to at least do some experimentation with it. Kristen? All right. I think Matt and the audience beat me to this. <laughs> I, when you and I played with it and we started getting a little silly and we were like, write a haiku about this, um, write a parody song about this. It can also be a way to get you out of stuckness for your art. And that is a really big benefit for me. Um, and I noticed that Matt even said he didn't just say writing prompts, he said, for drawing prompts and things like that. And, I, you know, sometimes you just have to hear other ideas to get out of your own stuck way when you're in creative mode, especially if you're creative um, who needs to get something done immediately because there will be an impact um, if you don't get to it. So, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to mention that. MJ? Um, yeah. So as, as much as my optimistic skeptic is about how you know, fast the technology is moving. Um, I do want to say that it has helped me get unstuck if I'm just trying to spit out ideas or just trying to, like right now, if, it, you know, I have ADHD, it takes me a little while to get to my point. And that's my point. What, what's the word phrase that I heard? I, it was in the alumni community. I would have written you a shorter note if I had more time. So it does help me with that. I don't necessarily use it as much as I probably could, but only because as someone who is a creative and as someone who does write, I do worry about the utilization of like people and people being creative people. But the optimist in me does say that it is a helpful tool for me right now just to, you know, take the big paper mache of words and 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 bring them a bit smaller. And for if you're listening to this on the podcast, I'm just making a big ball with my arms and just shrinking it down because that's what it feels like sometimes that I need to do is just shrink down what I'm trying to say in a lot less words. I could have probably said this in a lot less words, but hey, we have ADHD. Here's an example. Woohoo! Awesome. Yeah. I mean, there, I, I really think the ideas are, are endless and I would love to hear, um, you know, if people put in the chat and we can share some of them, uh, how some of you are using uh, chat GPT. Cause I know, I know people who have been getting into it have been really getting into it because I think it's it's really fun and kind of mind blowing. I was talking to someone just recently, and they they were talking about a position that they was just created in their company that it's like a an AI prompter because it's the idea of like it's not necessarily it's gonna it's I think it's gonna change the way we work. I don't think it's necessarily gonna like eliminate all of these different jobs, like because especially in the creative fields, we still need people to create stuff. I think it's gonna be this tool that that we use. I heard a. Uh, a story on NPR a while back where they were talking about his high school teacher gave an assignment um, and it had, uh, I think it was some historical, wanted them to look up some historical stuff. But the, this teacher said, find an error in its response. So it was like this teacher was really um, promoting the critical thinking aspect of what we need to be thinking about. We can't just say, oh, it's sort of like that, that old cliche. Oh, it's on the internet. It must be true, right? Like same thing. Oh, it's if chat a GPT or some other AI tool generated it. It must be true. No, we should definitely double and triple check sources. It was funny. I was I did a um when I was working on some email marketing not that long ago. It had referenced uh something about a, the Scientific Journal. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I want to I want to find and cite that. Non-existent. So I was like, ooh, this is really interesting. So there are definitely some some holes and some uh some challenges. There, but like as we said before, we're kind of at early, early days of uh, of AI. 
But I'm, I don't know, I'm excited about it. I think there's going to be lots of, uh, of cool things that come out of it, especially for our ADHD. All right, let's, let's take a quick break here. And uh, when we come back, um, we got a question about uh, fast brains. So we will be right back. Support for this podcast comes from our award-winning intensive coaching and accountability groups. Learn more at coachingrewired.com. Curious? Have questions? Wondering if group coaching is a good fit for you? Then good news. Last week, we had our summer registration kickoff event, and we are trying something new for our next one. Mark your calendars for May 17th, because from 9 a.m. Pacific, that's 12 p.m. Eastern, until 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, my team and I will be hosting a drop-in style registration event that you can join during those hours at any time, where we will be available to answer your questions and help you get registered. You don't even need to go through all the pre-registration steps ahead of time. You can do that with us at The Open House. Simply add your name to our interest list and RSVP to join us. Plus, we're giving you $500 off the cost of enrollment when you join a group with Coach Kristen or Coach Brian. That's next week on May 17th from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. Central Time. So how can you join us on May 17th? Head on over to coachingrewired.com, add your name to the interest list. Then as we get closer to the date and on the date, we will let you know by email how to join us live. Sure, our ADHD can get in the way sometimes, but that doesn't mean we can't live a full and intentional life. And when you join our intensive online coaching and accountability groups, you won't have to do any of this alone. The website again is coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our interest list and to get notified when we go live on May 17th for our drop-in summer registration event. So you can join us this summer and go from listening to ADHD Rewired to getting your ADHD Rewired. And plus, you could save $500. That's coachingrewired.com. We can't wait to meet you. And we're back. Our next question is from Sarish. Question is, why is it that with ADHD brains, we can think really fast and great in some situations, but fail in traditional work situations? If our brains work fast, why do we struggle in the real world? Well, you know, um, context matters. Our, where our executive functions are matter. You know, it's like one of these things where it's like, it just always depends. It, it, it depends, right? Like, what does it mean that, that our brains move fast? Does that mean it's like we're impulsive? Or does that mean that we can come up with solutions quickly? And if we are in an environment that isn't kind of well-suited or supporting our needs, that can make it even harder because the more we have to mask, the more we are using executive functions in a way that aren't actually helpful for the, the goal or the, the work project we're trying to do. Like I know for myself, like I, there'll be times where I'm, you know, coming up with ideas and they come very quickly to me. And then there's times where like I'll be in a team meeting and my brain just is done. And like, I, I'm literally just hearing womp, 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 like that's it. Right. And so it's having that self-awareness about like, what is it that, like, when does that happen? And when does your, our brain work well? And how could we sort of create our environments and, and, uh, try to get more control if we can of our schedule so we are able to sort of utilize our brain in the best way that we can at the best times that work for us. MJ? Uh, my first thought was that work situations aren't always fun. So acting on unfun stuff is a drag. But, you know, you put us in a crisis. Uh, okay, not necessarily fun, but if it's unexpected, it's a dopamine hit. It's not necessarily a positive dopamine hit, but it's a dopamine hit nonetheless. Like say, for example, uh, with a dopamine thing, like video games, video games are fun. I will have energy to play video games all day, all night. Making music is fun. Usually I can activate on that because it's fun and something that's tactile and something that I want to do. I'm also really great at tedious, boring tasks. But for me, I find that the easiest or most boring or even familiar tasks, routine tasks, um, I find are the hardest ones to activate on. I find that the hardest ones to get done. I don't know why I struggle with those. A lot of them are real world things, but what makes me <laughs> struggle with them is that a lot of them are boring. They don't give me a dopamine hit. 
I don't want to do laundry or pick up socks or do dishes. And it's also a matter for me, a matter of gauging what my energy is. I find that things that are not familiar, like certain work things, if I haven't slept well, if I haven't been active, gotten physical exercise, I find the the problem solving part for certain situations is a lot harder for me to, you know, put those wires together. But yeah, that's sort of my two cents. Easy to activate on fun stuff, tough to activate on boring stuff for me. Um, and I have to gauge my energy and where my self-care is at so that I can function maybe a little bit better depending on the work situation. Kristen? Yeah, there's a couple of things I'm thinking about here. And the part about fun uh, reminded me of there's also judgment in work and judgment is a big one that gets in our way. And then as I was thinking about it, I thought about I call my brain a pinball machine sometimes. And it's not just one ball. It's the time where you get two or three going. And yeah, I don't finish a thought before I've jumped to a different thought. So it's distracting. And then as I was thinking further, I was reminded of our chart we use that we were talking about what our executive function actually does. And there's like seven or eight areas that executive function is activating on. So hopefully this will help. In teaching one of my kids, uh, clients, I asked him who he likes. He likes the minions. And I said, imagine all the minions up there responsible for different jobs. They're working quickly, but sometimes one of them gets off track, you know, gets up, goes to the bathroom or, or gets scared about something and goes and runs and hides. So maybe that's the one that was working on problem solving. Maybe it's the one that was working on decision making. And so if one of those get off track, it's harder to create a singular focus in what we're doing. That's just a really simplistic way of kind of looking at that, if that's helpful too. Um, Because, yeah, I think when adrenaline kicks in and cortisol and things like that, it allows everyone to go, oh, we all have to fix this one problem. So all of them come together. And that's the difference in those moments. Brian? Uh, I was just going to pick up on the allusion to how we can think quickly but still fail. And I would imagine it this way. Imagine you have a computer with a super fast processor chip, but it doesn't have a whole lot of RAM it's still going to have a lot of difficulty executing the actual tasks. So there's, there's a differential between the processing speed and the execution of tasks. And so I'm not surprised at all about that. I, I, that makes total sense to me. But in traditional work situations, maybe the question is, what is the work situation? Is it the right work situation for the way you process information and execute on tasks? Because you made, I know it picked up on traditional, and I don't know what that means. It might mean office work, nine to five, that kind of thing. But traditional kind of implies neurotypical to me. So perhaps it's about looking for opportunities to find a different environment that fits you better. That's awesome. You know, our brains are funny. Like, I, th- I think if we sort of take a step back and, and almost look at the absurdity of like, how is it that we can like be kicking ass in certain areas and really struggle? In other areas, right? Like for me, when I'm facilitating a, um, a a coaching meeting or if I'm giving a presentation, I find that very energizing. When I'm doing a more of a collaborative meeting where we have to, have to make decisions, like I find that very draining, right? Like, so you would think, oh, like, but you like being in front of groups, like, yeah, but it's a different role, and and so it's really getting curious and and looking at right, what fuels me and what drains me. So we, we need to look, we all have to do stuff that's going to be draining sometimes, right? So it's learning how to manage our, our energy around that. What do we need to do before and after that to help us recover uh, from those kinds of things? So I hope that that was helpful. All right. Um, let's do one more question before we take another break. All right, Matt, what are your opinions on non-prescription nootropics? Yeah, snake oil. Um, that was the second part of his question. Are they like snake oil or do some seem to have benefits over getting a prescription? Here's the thing, like nootropics and stuff like that. It's just not FDA regulated stuff. So we have no idea what's actually in in these things. Um, So I would just say buy everywhere. Yeah, like I mean, the the science is not a good uh, uh, supporting a science. And when you see these companies say, oh, like our clinical trials show this. They're the ones doing the research. They're funding the research that is then being published. That's called conflict of interest, right? Like you need to have someone not connected at all with this company doing the, the research. It needs to be, it's called double blind, 
meaning that the person receiving a nootropic or medication, whatever it is, they don't know if they're getting that or if they're getting a placebo or sham, right? And the person administering it doesn't know if they are giving a placebo or if they're giving the actual uh, target agent, right? So I think it's really important to understand when something says, oh, but like our, our studies show, it's like, well, who is, who is studies, right? Um, so I would just be cautious of that. Like all that being said, is it possible that we may find that, sure, these nootropics can be really helpful? Maybe, maybe we'll find that. I just haven't seen any actual research or data that supports that. I have more fears around the what are the side effects? Because, it, you know, yeah, that's great that I'm hearing people um, are using them and getting benefits from it. My concern is what are side effects that are being discovered that that's just how I think, though. Um, I don't know. And you don't have any. Do you, I don't think you understand any counter in in. How do you say that word? Counter indicators. <laughs> counter indication. Yeah, yeah. Uh, between you know what are you taking this for that and that for that and and are they? Where I mean, there's a you've got to do a lot of research around it to know how your body works and how your brain registers things and and a sim, you know, takes in that stuff because I've even been told with prescription medicines, oh, well, don't take this while you're taking that because it'll just counter the benefit of that, you know, the other. And so there's all that stuff that you don't have the instructions or information around for. And yet there are people out there that I've heard try these things and they're helpful. So, you know, that's, that's the problem I think with it is the lack of knowledge and information and expectation around it. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, um, we, uh, well, there's a question about a password manager, and uh, I'm hoping there's going to be some more questions in the Q&A box. I have a question after, so, you know, we got that. And, we'll, and MJ's question. And we will be <laughs> right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our patrons at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Do you want additional support and some perks from the podcast? We have perks at five, 10, and $25 a month, all of which include uninterrupted episodes of this show. These announcements are then put at the end of the episode so you don't miss what's going on here at ADHD Rewired. Then at $25 a month, you can join me for a monthly coaching call every fourth Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Many of our patrons give simply because they want to support the work that we are doing. The Patreon contributions get put back into the podcast and my team, and we really do appreciate your support. So if it is in the cards for you right now, consider becoming a patron over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Remember, perks start at just $5 a month where you can get ad-free episodes, and at $25 a month, you can jump into our monthly coaching calls and get a taste of group coaching. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thank you. ADHD Rewired listeners, say hello to the Foot Out Mouthinator, your social savior for those awkward, accidental moments tailor-made for good-intentioned, neurodivergent brains. Had enough of those uh-oh moments. Realizing you've been an accidental asshole, leaving you blue? Fear not, my friend. The Foot Out Mouthinator's here to rescue you. What's the Foot Out Mouthinator, you wonder? It's a cutting-edge earpiece, making sure you never blunder. Tracking your chit-chat in real time, helping you avoid those verbal crimes. Too brash, too critical, or simply impolite? Foot Out Mouthinator's your guardian, day and night. Hold up, there's more. The Foot Out Mouthinator isn't just an average ear gadget, my mates. It's your social cheerleader, making sure you and others are feeling great. Every time you bond or share a genuine smile, Foot Out Mouthinator will celebrate, making it all worthwhile. So don't let ADHD rain on your social parade. Get the Foot Out Mouthinator and never feel dismayed. So if your friends don't call you back, or your boss or team just gave you the sack. If you're wondering if it's something you said, you can get the foot out mouthinator. If only it weren't an idea I just made up in my head. While this product, unfortunately, is not real, the support you can get here is the real deal. So make sure you hit subscribe to the pod and visit us online to see everything we've got. Go to ADHDrewired.com. And we're back. All right. So we got uh, 
questions coming in here with uh, a first one. What is a good password manager? I'll tell you that I use, like I forgot the name of the password manager, which is why I'm stalling to look it up. It's uh, one password. That's what I use. What's everyone else use? I've heard a lot of good things about BitLocker lately. So I think that there was a password manager that recently got hacked. I use my own physical notebook because I got tired of forgetting what I was using, not making change, not adding the save when I would change it, stuff like that. I, I know exactly where it is. <laughs> I can go right to it. I, I always, if I'm changing it, I'm thinking about, oh, got to change it in there. Um, that, that's the main one I do because I had to go with what do I do naturally? And I got away from trying to do the thing that everyone says to do. And yeah, someone said it was um, LastPass was the one that got uh, recently hacked. Uh, saw that in the chat. Someone said they switched from LastPass to Bitwarden and they're, they're pleased with it. Yeah, I think that password managers are, are great. You know, it's obviously it's, it's, it seems to be like a, a, a uh, the holy grail for hackers. But like, I think that, that, that one that got hacked is, was more rare than, I don't know. But I also, you know, you can use the, the um, what is it, the, in iCloud um, or have your, your, your browser save passwords. You know, the other thing is you can use past phrases, like come up with clever ways to, like, in creative maybe spellings and stuff. Like, wh whatever works best for you. What, what is your sort of natural tendency? The thing that I would definitely recommend, though, is at least once a year is go through and change your passwords. Absolutely. It's a pita. It's a pain in the ass, right? But, like... You know what's also a pain in the ass? Dealing with identity theft. Why the hell would someone want my ADHD identity? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to know. Because <laughs> it seems so fun until they realize the reality of all this shit we're dealing with. All right. Um, do we have other questions? Oh, we have a question from MJ. MJ, what is your question? Good thing I wrote it down. So since we are transitioning seasons where we are, um, what are some ba some ways to bounce back from the seasonal change from, you know, winter to spring to summer? Because this is the time of year that I am typically in a significant amount of physical pain, which I am currently managing. I don't know what it is. Just the, the transition of seasons just sucks for me. Every year, I don't have depression, but I do get pretty sad during this like sort of transition time of the year. So what are some ways to bounce back from the winter? MJ, if it... If the transition for you were as smooth as possible, what would that be like? Um, I guess I'm sort of already doing it now is bringing back more physical activity because I know that, that keeps my energy going winter time. I usually slow down a little bit with that, but more weightlifting, a little bit more cardio again. We're, now that there's no snow on the ground, we can take the dog to the dog park and a mild like some some very small changes to my eating lifestyle just because I, I do change that from season to season. Um, I don't like to use this phrase, but like maybe it's all in my head. There's just something about the spring season that makes things tougher, but I feel like I'm doing the right things, but I'm just wondering if anybody else maybe experiences that hard transition between the seasons of it just feels weird. Weird how? I, my next phrase out of my mouth was going to be, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> imagine you didn't know how to describe it is it out of sync maybe like you and because usually the time change doesn't bother me that much it seems to have affected me a bit more this year than it has in previous years hmm. imagine i did know i really don't know lisa well, i think for me this part of the season feels like the most change is happening like i feel i go from winter like from into fall into winter and it's like just this slow like decline of like laziness and just like gross whatever <laughs> and then this part just kind of feels really abrupt I think because we go from feeling so ishly and like winter grossness to Literally, it's 75 degrees outside today, and I'm like roasting in my office. And all I want to do is be outside in the sun. So I feel like that's just such a fast transition this way versus going into the winter that maybe that's what's so jarring to us. Hmm. Do you like being outside in like the nice weather, MJ? Yeah. 
minus the allergies, but in general, yeah, in general. How Sorry. much? How much of the allergies like has an impact on you? Because that could for sure make it like, yeah. You know, I think that for some people who like for like you look at like sleep procrastination, explore sleep apnea. Maybe there's a reason you're procrastinating to go to sleep because you are like almost dying every time you go to bed. So maybe this the untreated allergies could be a thing. I don't know. I forgot about the allergy piece. That makes sense because histamines. Like when I get a high histamine, I'm histamine just. It, it's not fun. Hmm. Brian? I was also going to hit on uh, just uh, how is, I'm curious how your sleep is during this transition, MJ, but also how is your outdoor time in general? Like how much time do you actually spend outdoors and when? Uh, well, more now that we're, we take the dog to the dog park and mm-hmm. it'll be easier to take her out during like mid afternoon walks now that it's not dark out at three o'clock. So this is sort of the time of year that I'm getting outside more. The windows are open. There's more sunshine. I have to push myself to to go out, but that part actually doesn't seem as hard this year as it did last year. So maybe that's, there's a wind in there somewhere. I just dread the allergy part. And yeah, thinking about the histamine piece, that could be what sort of makes me feel off regardless of like medication, sleep, exercise. Um, Because I do sleep really, like I sleep like a rock. I will wake up in the same position that I fell asleep in sometimes. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious because there's a lot of emerging research, which I can't cite off the top of my head, that outdoor time is particularly good. But also you want to be aware of the light shifts from this time of year. You may be a little bit out of alignment with uh, like your circadian rhythm and just getting light exposure in the morning times, even if you don't leave the house might be a good strategy to kind of like get you rekeyed to the physiologically to the passing of the seasons. First thing in the morning would probably be helpful now that the sun rises a lot earlier than it used to. So are you familiar with uh, Andrew Huberman? No. He is a, he's a great podcaster. He has, he's a stand, he's like head of neurobiology at Stanford university and he gives lots of great life hacks. He has a great morning protocol that he talks about almost excessively on his podcast. Uh, I would recommend checking that out. Awesome. That was very helpful. I have some ideas because I, I know I'm doing a lot of right things. It just, things feel funky and it it actually is kind of helpful to know that I'm not the only one that's sort of experiencing this weirdness of transition from the seasons because it does feel a little bit jarring every year for me. Hmm. You know, it does make me think too that how important it is when we are, you know, trying to, to problem solve all, all these different things we are also like considering and trying to rule out any other underlying medical issues. I think sometimes we forget that, that piece. Like it's, you know, there's times where I'm like, I'm feeling like I have no energy. I don't know why I have no energy. And then a couple of days later, I'm like, Oh, my asthma is flaring up. I just didn't realize it, that this was my asthma uh, until a few days when I get, when my sort of secondary symptoms started kicking in. Cause at first it's usually just like low energy. And the reason I'm low energy, cause my, my lungs aren't getting the amount of oxygen they need. Kristen. There's also the idea of the body keeps the score. You know, if you're exploring all the physical and environmental factors and you're still got some ickiness, there was um, the example I can give you is the year uh, my father died. He died in March and we always went to the state fair in October and we were all out at the driveway and I was an anxious wreck. I was shaking my hands and I was about to cry. I was, uh, couldn't figure it out. The family was there because we all go together. And um, all of a sudden it hit me. It was his birthday. Hmm. Somehow my body was keeping the score of that. And the reason I say that is that is a, oh, I just saw an aha uh, uh-huh there maybe. Uh, <laughs> her face. There, that is a seasonal time of a shift. And it that's what struck me as y'all were talking because I went, oh, I could have attributed that to something external or something. And for some reason, somehow it hit me what was going on because I was feeling it because we go every year and it always feels good. And for some reason that year it's, it was different and I couldn't even, and once I pinpointed it, it was like, ah, it's still, there was some grief that I had to do it. And so it's just that idea of even if it's asthmas and like you're not recognizing it, your body's keeping the score. Your body is triggering into it and maybe even getting on the alert. Even if you're not sick yet, it's thinking, oh, it's that time of year. I know you're going to get sick. I got to be on the ready. And your body, you know, because it's got its own little CPU up there doing its thing. So it's just a thought that occurred to me as you all were exploring those things. 
Thanks, Kristen. Now I wrote down the thing I need to bring to my therapist next week that is related to this time of year. Nice work here, Kristen. All right. Um, we got a question from Lori. I'm not sure if Lori wants to go live, uh, so I'll read the question here. Uh, how should I handle the fact that my ASD level one diagnosis in November, so that's autism spectrum disorder, it dismissed my 2019 ADHD combined diagnosis in 2019 as being better explained by autism? Am I ADHD or not? And should I stop ADHD therapy and focus on autism therapy in that it might help indirectly with the ADHD? Very confusing feelings right now. Okay. I'm imagining we probably all have some thoughts on, uh, on this one. Uh, Kristen, you want to wanna take it first? All right. Yeah. Um, first of all, one of the things I first explain to clients who come into my office is there is a, a Venn diagram that, um, you know, I, in my head of anxiety, ASD, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, and then sensory issues. And the circle in the middle of overlap is huge. <laughs> So how they do diagnoses is it's not just checking off the behaviors that are presenting. It's also when did they first come into play in your life? Are there any factors that um, mitigate them? Uh, natural factors. How long have you been dealing with it? You know, those sort of things. So there's, you know, inten intensity and frequency, all these sort of things. First of all, you are not a diagnosis. I'm wondering what is it? that showed up in the, 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 the evaluation that said, okay, you actually fall more into the category of ASD. What are those things that if you're focusing on helping your ADHD presentation, what are those things that are outside that circle that need focus and attention also? Are they going to be things that are not impacting you as much right now? I have a daughter with severe autism. And I am learning more and more every day that I have more and more traits in that spectrum. And it throws me off and it makes me angry. Um, I was very happy to continue working on just ADHD. <laughs> what it did, though, was open my eyes to, okay, how can I modify a new skill or a, a possible strategy that cultivates around, because ASD, that's, that's, it's more the lot my natural life course things like i am very sensory issued i am not if i need to go lose weight and a lot of the adhd presentation is impacting my ability to do some sort of life change plan in my eating i am not going to be able to change the fact that i have sensory issues to certain foods and that's that asd part so what can i do with that as i'm strategizing adhd parts to be able to put in a new healthy eating plan for myself. I hope that's sort of making sense. I think you, you've you got to work on what is speaking to you the most and, and not get all tangled up in those weeds around that, I think. You know, I think that any diagnosis is a starting point to sort of start to, to find where can we find more answers and, and understanding, right? So... I mean, it was not that long ago. I mean, literally, just, I don't know, five years ago before the DSM changed to actually to allow for ADHD and autism to be diagnosed together. Uh, I mean, as a as a clinician, because before I started uh, ADHD Rewired, that's what I was doing. I was working with autism and ADHD, and I thought it was the most ridiculous thing that you couldn't have ADHD and autism like diagnosed together. Because I think I had one client on my caseload that only had autism or what was called Asperger's at the time and it was like this puzzle sort of to me it looked so different because every other client I've worked with had both right no matter what the DSMs at that time said like it was allowed so we now understand uh, that the DSM does allow for that dual diagnosis but I think the most important thing to look at is functional impairment like what where are the areas you're struggling is it because of the ADHD is it because of the autism like maybe yes could be both Right. So it's looking at like, what's, what are the biggest challenges? Is it 
Is it time? Is it stuff around anxiety? Is it uh, overwhelm? Is it overwhelm because of executive function? Is it overwhelm because of sensory issues? Is it overwhelm because of, over of EF and sensory issues? Like, so it's really looking at all um, of those things. I do think that that looking at sensory issues, that that's a prominent thing. It's a really important thing. That, that's biological. And if our body doesn't feel good, we can't learn. I mean, it's hard to really function, right? So I think it's really important to, to explore those, those sensory issues. You know, if your therapist is, is helping you right now, like in their specialty is, is ADHD, just I would encourage you to talk to them about this concern, right? Because you might not need to find a different therapist. And, and most, I think, people who do work in ADHD at the very least have some understanding of autism. And many have seen both and, and see the overlaps sort of, of both. Can I share too? A lot of therapists, yeah, if they're expert in ADHD, the more they learn from their clients because they want to be able to flesh out the differences so that they are better at assessing what the where to go in the intervention piece of it and helping each individual. And so if you have a therapist like that, hang on to that therapist for sure. Because that's one of the hardest things to find is a therapist where the relationship is beneficial and it's working for you. Yeah. All right. We have a question here about, uh, is there any research that indicates baseline dopamine levels are negatively impacted over time by taking stimulant medication? I love this question. I, uh, so I actually do have an answer uh, for that. Um, I'm right now going through the, um, the um, C's. It's a advanced like clinician certification for ADHD. Anyway, so I was uh, going through the the modules with uh, Russell Barkley, and he actually talked about the genetic sequence of dopamine, and that the uh, our our the chains, the dopamine chains aren't um, the same as neurotypical brains. They tend to be a little bit longer, so there's like that, that satiation doesn't happen as easily. But one of the things he did talk about is that um, long-term medication treatment does appear to aid in the development of those, um, the, the sequences of, of dopamine to make those chains a little bit shorter, which is what we actually want. You know, so is there a long-term impact? Yes, but it's positive, which is great news, right? And it's, it's uh, just more reinforcement that these medications are safe and effective um, when taken as prescribed and, you know, as far as like positive responses to, to medications, ADHD meds are kind of awesome. Like is not everyone, but a larger than you would think percentage of people have very positive treatment responses to this class of medication. I mean, we're talking somewhere between 70 to 90 percent have a positive treatment response. That doesn't mean that all the symptoms go away. That is not what a positive positive treatment response means. It means symptoms are reduced. Side effects are minimal. That's a positive treatment response. All right, I think that might be, uh, that was the last question. Well, I wanted to thank all of you for, for being here, uh, our, our panel of panelists and our people who ask questions. Uh, thank you. We do this every single month, same time, uh, second Tuesday of the month at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, so thank you. We'll see you back here next month at the same time. Thanks, everybody. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. 
Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls. And $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator Jim Dale is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.